<clears throat> Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, meeting of uh, Mahone Bay Town Council. We just finished our special hearing on the strategic plan. That report will be coming to council on March the 9th. We do have uh, a full house of councillors with the exception of Councillor Carver, who sends her regrets. Uh, the, um, we have an agenda, but before we do that, we'll acknowledge once again that we are gathered tonight at Mi'kmaq, the ancestral present and future territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Tonight we gather with the intent followed by the peace, the living peace and friendship treaties with respect, cooperation, and coexistence. Some of uh, our citizens are joining us via YouTube, and I would remind them that at the end of the regularly scheduled agenda, before we address the one in-camera session that we have tonight, those of you at home uh, following us on YouTube will have the opportunity to ask a question about any item that is discussed tonight. With that, we'll call the meeting to order. Council, you have an agenda that was emailed to you. There is one amendment to that agenda, and that is to add an, an item 7.3, which deals with the approval of NJSB to uh, acquire a new loading machine. So we'll hear more about that as the, as our meeting goes along. Other than that, appreciate a motion, Councillor uh, Feeney, to approve the, I assume, to approve the agenda as amended. Thank you. Seconded, Councillor Wilson. On the question, all in favor, <clears throat> the motion is carried. First item is the minutes of the regular meeting of February the 7th. Councillor Wilson. Move to accept the meeting minutes as circulated. Seconded by Councillor Now. You've heard the motion. On the question, all in favor? That motion is carried as well. Thank you. And we'll go right into our presentations. And tonight we are joined with uh, joined by Tim Mary uh, with Mahon with the Mahon MBU Mahon Bay United right? yeah. and Dave Stevens, who is the, the chair of the Mahon Bay Center Society. And they are going to collectively talk with us about the community sports field. So, gentlemen, over to you. Thank you. We are now going to attempt to share screen one more time. It's going to go great. Screen broadcast. Start broadcast. There we go. And then this should broadcast out to the folks who are watching too. So there we are. Bingo. Well, good. We can see all. And it's online. Cool. Amazing technology. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you for having us back. I think I, I was just saying I was last here in January of last year. That was 2022. It's 2023 now. So um, and that was prior to work starting on the field. And we had secured this ACOA grant and we were talking through about how we would go ahead with the with the kind of delivery of the successful application to secure the grant to kind of upgrade the field facility. Um, uh, we're now on the other side of that in some ways. You know, it's a year later. We're meeting face to face. And the facility has gone through a major upgrade. And I think there's kind of three things I want to do. One is kind of like remind you of what Mahone Bay United is and what we're doing. Allow Dave to talk to Mahone Bay Centre in relationship to that. We want to kind of summarise where we're at on the kind of field development and give you an update, both in terms of what's been done, but also what's been spent. And then we want to talk about how we might move forward from here in relation to having this kind of recreational facility now built in the town. Like, and and the one thing I'll say is, um, I just uh, I'm not here to pitch anything to you. I'm here to figure this out with you, right? What we've got now is a wonderful facility in the community. We've got an organisation like Mahone Bay United that is running top-notch recreational programming 
for very large numbers of people in the community, ranging from four through to 65 years old, you know, and we've got the Mahone Bay Centre, which is also running top-notch recreational uh, programming year round, both of us, uh, for also for very extended days. But I don't think you go as young as four. Well, you're in our building. So That's yeah. true. That is true. That's true. Our minis programs happen in the Mahone Bay Centre building. They totally. So we do. So I think that's it. So I think this is I think this is an invitation on one level to kind of celebrate the incredible work, the collaboration between Town of Mahone Bay, Mahone Bay Centre and Mahone Bay United, what we've achieved. So far. <laughs> the second piece is to say, well, how do we want to proceed with this? You know, and and there's there's no easy answer to that. This is a conversation. So if you're expecting me to come here with like, here's the sweet way we move forward. I, I don't have it. We have ideas and we have suggestions, but I think we're faced by choices. And those are choices that we need to make together because all of these organizations have to choose to work together to continue to sustain the facility. Right. So I think that's where we're at. And it's a good place to be, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. A reminder what Mahone Bay United is. We're an all-inclusive soccer club. So we were set up basically to provide no obstacles to play soccer. It started out by me coaching my daughter on the field. Suddenly I had 16 kids. And then now we've got 225 kids running through winter soccer this winter. Uh, we absolutely see ourselves as a soccer club, not a team, which means that we consider ourselves part of the community. We're here to stay. Everybody on the board of 14 people wants this club to survive way beyond their death. We're here to be part of the fabric of the community. We don't even put out competitive teams. That's not the kind of club we are. We provide free access, recreational programming to young people and adults year round. Um, and then we, uh, the focus is on development, is on the growth of people, you know. And in terms of the evaluations that we get from our programs, you know, we do an evaluation every single year. The first thing that people talk about in the evaluation is belonging. That's the first thing they talk about. We have people moving from away or moving into this community or people who have been part of this community for many years and they talk about the belonging they experience in the programming. The second thing they talk about is confidence, is the confidence that the kids get from being in the program. So there's lovely stories of like a, uh, a young girl who came into the came into the it's just beyond the minis pro, the second level of the minis programming. She turned up and she wouldn't even participate in the first session. By the fifth session, she was fully participating. By the end of it, a mum came up to me and said, "You know what? She started out not doing any recreational stuff. By the end of the soccer program, she's now in art and music, right? And so there's something that we're doing in the program that raises the confidence of so many of the kids we engage with. And then the last thing they say is that their soccer's got better. <laughs> Right. But it literally goes in that order. The, the evaluations we get belonging. We're creating community. We're building confidence in the kids and the adults we work with. And you know what? People's soccer skills are getting better. But that's the third degree. Right. So this gives you a little sense of how the club's grown over the years. Started out with 16 kids, 2018, 19, when we kind of made ourselves real. We've now moved up to 225 kids in the winter program this year. We only track the numbers in the winter program because our other programs are dropping. We don't track the numbers. So we, this is how we, those are the numbers you see there. You can see the coaches and volunteers have gone from two to now 40 volunteers this year. So we have 225 kids. We have two locations. We have 30 coaches on the field every Sunday night, and it's zero bucks for any family to play. There is no other year round free access soccer club in Nova Scotia full stop. It does not exist. Right, we are doing something completely unique in the province here, right? Which is considered by people like Soccer Nova Scotia to be remarkable because the cost of sport is rising to participate. So if you don't have money and you don't have transport and you don't have a supportive family, you do not get access to sport in this province, full stop. And we're doing something fundamentally against the grain here, something Mahone Bay should be excited about. Operations fundraised, we got to 22,000 last year. Right. I'll show you what it cost us to run. It was shooting for 25 this year. You can see the facilities run fundraise over the year. The, the 78 and 50 that adds up to what we raised for the uh, sports field. Before that, it was the basketball field and then the new goals, which, of course, went to the town. Mm -hmm. So we raised the money. And then there was two thousand dollars that we raised for the Mahone Bay pool. This year we raised money for the Bay Bayview Community Equity Fund. And we also contributed to the Mahone Bay Food Bank Drive where we were collecting food at all of our programming. And then we mm -hmm. dropped it off. Um, in the Bayview boat. There's a big boat that collects the food in Bayview. So everything we had collected in our program went into the Bayview boat. And so, uh, so that's where we're at. We're targeting uh, 28,000 to support facilities this year. All right. 
That's what it looked like, 21-22. Right? You can't see the top because there's a thing over it. 22 organizations, 18 personal gifts, total operations, operations income of around 22712 The expenses it cost us to run the club year round, rent, insurance, uh, training of coaches, facilities, rentals, equipment purchase came in just under 20 grand, which explains the $2,700 we have in the account, right? And that we actually have more than that, but like that's how it all balances out, right? In the run of things. Um, and so you can see there's large community support, right? I mean, I think the thing that strikes me is that whatever we're doing, we're responding to a need because of the numbers of users and the amount of support we're getting from our community. If we weren't responding to a need or doing something useful here, people wouldn't be supporting us people wouldn't be turning up to the programming. So for me, there's no doubt that what we're doing meets a large need in our community. Uh, there's a picture of Councillor uh, Kangata running the girls program on Fridays on the field, um, which is a fantastic part of the programming, we run programming, girls programming on Fridays. And then on Sundays, we run the free access programming. All right, let's get into the field upgrade. Bear in mind, we did things before we even started doing the field up, right? We upgraded the basketball courts, Right, um, which have continued their new goals. And what we noticed when we put the new goals down and we redid the basketball courts was that people started using it more. And so this created the equation in our board's head that when you care for something, people use it more, right? And so that then drove us into this idea of like, let's see what we could do to care for the field and to increase the use on the field. And so in many ways, that was the impetus behind raising the money for the field when we secured the uh, COA grant. And I think the other thing that's notable is of course the partnership between NBC and MBU is huge, but we've also now built an incredibly strong partnership with Bayview Community School in that we use their gym year round, we exchange facilities with each other, we're there, we're running a high performance program this year, again the first ever free access high performance program in the province is being run in this town, right, the, uh, the school is, is running programs, soccer programs in the school to help identify kids, right, because we want to access kids who don't make it to pay to play. Where are those kids? They're in the schools. So we've engaged PE teachers all over the region to find the kids who don't make it to pay to play who are talented. So there's a great partnership there between some of the major institutions in the community really working together. And in many ways, the, the collaboration is one of the most exciting things here, you know, with the town of Mahone Bay in that bucket as well. We're really proving wrong this idea that people don't work together in this town, that institutions don't work well together. They do, they get things done. The proof is in the pudding, go look at the field, right? I mean, it's quite that simple. Here's what we did. So the field was graded and resurfaced. We've got a playing area of 100, 100, 100 by 50 meters, which is within FIFA recommendations, so recommended sizes for competitive sport. So we, we can host competitive games. You chose to bury the electrical wires, which was awesome, which means we can, we can consider sports like rugby on the field. People can go fly drones there safely, all of those things that that opens up recreationally for the field. So thank you for that. French drains, ditching and additional culvert were added. The additional culvert was added to handle overflow that might come down on Fairmont. So you've got that flooding that happens on the corner there. That's all there. Backstop fencing was put in place. Border planting was done with trees. There's a walking track that now runs around the outside of the field that's used regularly even now. It's just up there. I mean, even in the snow, you can see the footprints going around the outside. It's quite lovely. Um, and then um, uh, there's the trails, the connection to the trails. So there's a there never used to be a path from the Mahone Bay Centre um, uh, car park to the trails. There's now a trail there. It connects to the trail that goes down past the power station. Um, and then, of course, you've also invested in the orchard area and cleaning out that orchard area um, as another kind of lovely addition to a recreational space. You know, So you've got something that's very active in terms of the field and you've got something that's quite passive and relaxing in terms of the orchard area. It makes it a very complete kind of recreational opportunity, I think, for the town. Um, and then, of course, the wheelchair accessible bleachers. You, you know, Dylan and your staff raised the money to get bleachers in there. Um, that are now wheelchair accessible. So we're filling accessibility requirements on that field as well, which I think is not only laudable, essential in today's world, right? And we're now in the process of sorting out the sports equipment library. And what that would mean is that anyone can turn up to that field and access the equipment to play there, right? And so there's a library where you're gonna be able to loan that equipment. And we're in the middle of figuring that out right now. We've secured some funding, we're talking to funding, and we're talking to the Nova Scotia Community College uh, carpentry program to help us build it. Right, and talking to my home base center about how we organize it and all of that. So that's underway. Um, and so we're gonna be we're gonna be on the on the field, hopefully by the end of April. I might be on the field by the beginning of April. 
because I'm going to be out there with the high performance crew. But really, you know, that would just be the top end of the field nearest to Richard's house. Um, but the far end of the field won't be used. It's got to be reseeded again um, just to keep it nice and flush and get the top soil on it. Um, so at the end of April, we expect the field to be kind of open for business, if you like. People can just be using it and all kinds of stuff. Good. So summary of the ACOA grant, right? Here it is. ACOA gave us 77 grand, 1,700. Tannenberg Bay contributed towards the culvert. BMI put in 10 grand towards the backstop fences. Bridgewater Chiropractor put in another 1,000. Mahone Bay United raised some money for a total of 105. That secured us the 77,700 from ACOA. A COA grant, thank you very much. Good work done in the community. Take another step back. You look at this, what's been spent on this place from 22 to 23. It's a slightly larger number. You see the new culvert going in. You see the backstop fencing, storage and equipment. So this is the expenditure rather than the securing of the grants, right? So you can see the, that's what we've done over this year. And then if you look since we started doing it up, there's been 136,000. 500 roughly spent on the field since we started doing up the basketball area. So this has been not just a massive investment of volunteer hours, which is uncountable. I've been spending up to a day a week of my work life contributing to getting this field over the line. It's been no small effort, right? Um, but it's also been a massive input of money into our community that has been sourced by a non-profit volunteer-led community organization and then supplemented by the municipality, which has been fantastic. Right. Again, another successful example of collaboration. So we did this together. Thank you. You gave us council time. You gave us a letter of support that enabled us to get it. You gave us staff time. Dylan and John have been absolutely amazing as we've gone through all the iterations and problems of getting the field, like the ups and downs, the vicissitudes of not being able to get things and four months for things to arrive and ditches being dug and grading being wrong. And I mean, it's just as everybody knows, when you're dealing with contracting, there's loads of ups and downs. They've both been incredible. Uh, the culvert installation, burying the electrics, walking track installation and orchard clearance. It's no small part that the council and the town staff have played in this. So thank you for that. It's been a huge contribution to what we've been able to achieve. And that's really what it's all about, isn't it? That little picture. Um, and you'll see teachers in there from uh, Bayview Community School, as well as myself. You'll see mums from working mums from within the community who are volunteering at the club. We have a massive range of people who volunteer and come at the play at the club. Even the drop-in games we're now doing at the uh, um, Bayview Community School, we're getting we're getting between 20 and 26 adults every single Sunday coming out to play drop-in soccer. And uh, adults who are moving here from many, many different parts of the world. It is the most international experience I get living in this region playing soccer on Sunday nights in Mahone Bay, right? So there's something this club is doing that is creating the conditions for belonging for people who move here from away, where often it is very, very difficult if you don't look like everybody else or sound like everybody else to belong in a community like this one, right? So this club is creating an avenue for settlement, I believe, in a way that wouldn't be available otherwise. So <clears throat> the field future, what are we looking at? We're now, we'd like, we'd now like to get an agreement in place. When we first talked about this January last year, we talked about Mahone Bay Centre and Mahone Bay United kind of taking, you know, taking over the management of that field. We're exploring that agreement. We've been working very hard and diligently with, uh, with Dylan to draft that agreement up. There's been lots of back and forth. We're getting very close. I know that's going to come to council following this meeting. Um, uh, and, you know, really the purpose of us taking it over would be to manage the bookings, to maintain the field and to promote the field for use, right? That's really what it would be up to. Um, uh, Mahone Bay Centre would be really looking after the kind of bookings and admin and promotion. Mahone Bay United would be taking over the maintenance element of it. Should we choose to go into an agreement together? Mm -hmm. Should we choose to go into an agreement together, right? Um, we would propose to name it the Mahone Bay Community Sports Field. I hope you'll take our opinion into account when you do it. We've certainly have put enough blood sweat, blood, sweat and tears into this. I think to be able to lend an opinion into the mix, uh, we think sports fields helpful because it elevates sport. When you look at the when you look at the facility, because it is a facility now. When you look at the facility, it says sports, you know. But so we wanted to elevate sports, but we didn't want to exclude community events either. Um, and so uh, so obviously we want it to be inclusive of recreation and cultural purposes. But we think calling it a community sports field is going to massively reduce the chances of it being rented for a heavy metal concert or something like that. <laughs> so we think it does us a good, it does us a service, right? To call it a sports field in terms of warding off 
some of the things that we're going to have to negotiate as a group of organizations that are stewarding this, uh, what is now remarkable facility. Um, uh, and then beyond that, obviously, you're the owners of the field. So any kind of improvements to the structures itself, rather than things that sit on top of it, are going to have to be done in relationship with each other, should we take over management, right? Um, and uh, we would imagine that would always be in partnership. If we were to take in that, we would imagine that always be in partnership with, that, with us. So what are we thinking about? We're thinking about a three-year agreement. Could we give it a shot for three years? See how it goes. Do we like managing it? Do you like us managing it? Does my home base center like managing it? Do we all get along enough with each other to manage it? Like, let's try it out for three years and see how it goes. So nobody's bought into something they don't want to be in, whether that's a fiscal reason or a relational reason. At least then we know what we're up to and we can run a three-year test, right? Um, we're requesting an administration and maintenance grant similar to the pool to maintain the field as a recreational facility. This is no longer a surplus property, whether it's zoned that way or not. I don't know what the outcome of your, of your strategic plan is going to be on the zoning of that field. But in terms of use, it is a recreational facility now. And so it's, it is insufficient to mow it like a field twice a week. It needs more than that kind of maintenance for it to be used as a sports and recreational facility. Um, and we've spent, as a club that is volunteer driven, we spent an enormous amount of time fundraising and managing the, and implementing the kind of plan for the upgrading of the field. And we really need to turn our attention back to fundraising and securing uh, programming for kids and adults in the community. That's our main purpose, right? So I don't want to add uh, we already run a tight budget. I don't want to have to add a very large amount to our fundraising that takes away from our ability to then fund programming for kids. It's a pretty clear directive I got from my board, the amount of time I've spent on this and the amount of effort it's taken me, right? And therefore the additional effort I have to make to then also go raise funds to support the programming has been exhausting, right? But I'm very happy with where we're at, right? Um, so I've gone out and I've talked to lots and lots of people. So these are large numbers. I don't expect you not to be shocked. I'm shocked. So uh, this is what I want us to figure out together, right? And we can talk about it however we would like. So $28,000 seems like a lot of money. Let me talk you through some of it. And you're welcome to pull up the budget, which is the link at the bottom of it if you want to see the details. So the reseeding, you know, what happened last year, it was aerated and reseeded by Nature's Reflections Landscaping. It's taken in the areas that were um, uh, you can see here on the reseeding year one, it's like it's nearly $5,000 to reseed it this year because that has to be able to reseed the area that we already seeded because it didn't take. It only took in the aeration holes. So there needs to be a more aggressive scuffing up of that surface for the seed to be able to take. So that's a pretty, that's a considerable piece. Um, the other piece that pushes up the year two uh, to 28 as opposed to 18 is that we're suggesting purchasing an auto mower. Right, an auto mower we purchased for six thousand dollars in the first year. It cost us one hundred and eighty-four dollars every single year after that to maintain it. If we go ahead with mowing, and uh, we would mow twice a week because you have to mow a recreational surface to keep a dense grass cover to protect it from heavy use. If you don't mow regularly, it becomes bare and unusable. Right, so you have to mow regularly to get the density of the surface. Right, and so you mow twice a week. We end up we end up having to pay six thousand three hundred dollars a year for the mowing over seven months, twice a week. So it's far more economical for us to invest in an auto mower. No, nobody steals them, right? The same people who are providing to us are the people who do the airport and they also do the citadel up in the city, right? So these are public spaces where these are being used and they're being used in sports fields all over the world. They've been used in sports fields all over Europe. Uh, you can't pick them up, they've got alarms. You can't even control it if you take it because it's run off the phone. Right. It's a, it's a software based machine. So um, uh, so they, they don't get stolen. Um, and then so that's the auto mower. Um, and then the other areas is fertilization twice a year, liming, aeration, grub. I don't know if you anybody's been up and seen the sports field, the ball field up there. The surface of the, the surface of the ball field has been torn off and you can see it here. I put pictures of it in because it's so horrific, because every time I go there, I imagine it happening to the community sports field and start to cry after all the work we've put in. Um, and so, you know, that to resurface that whole field would be would be somewhere. Well, we would we were going to resurface just the end of it. So would have cost us forty thousand dollars. So to resurface that whole field is going to be somewhere between 40 and 60. So if we don't put four grand a year into grub gone and we don't put four grand a year into BioTitan, which is for cinch bugs, which is $8,000 a year, we may well end up with a 40 to $60,000 fee 
right? To resurface the whole field because it's been torn up by bugs and crows and all other critters that live in our community. So these are the numbers, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to convince you that uh, of anything. I'm not trying to oversell you on anything. I've gone to talk to landscaping companies. I've gone through it line by line with them. They've convinced me that this is what you need to put into a field to maintain it successfully throughout the year as a reasonable facility. We can make choices. We can go through this and be like, we're just not going to do that. And we're going to take the risk. That's okay. But I feel like that's a conversation between the three partners. And then we all know that risk. And we need to talk about what happens if the grub, if grubs get into that field and how, what we're going to do about it then, you know what I mean? So I'm not, so I think that's it. And then when you get to year two and three, gets down to 18,000 because we don't have to do the reseeding. We don't have to do the purchase of the auto mower, right? That's 10 grand in the first year. So it then gets to the eight, down to the 18,000, which is the maintenance of the facility. There is money in there to support my home base center doing administration, right? Of all the bookings, right? And cleaning the washrooms. Right. And I was about to say, and the fact that because there's going to be increased use, there's going to be increased use of my home base center facilities that are associated with the field. So those are the kind of numbers when you look into the budget yourselves, you can see those are the kind of numbers that are built in. And I'm happy to go through that budget in detail with any of you individually or collectively. I'm happy to talk about taking things out and putting them in. I just want to be in a conversation about the risks of taking things out to make sure that's a shared under, shared understanding of the risk. You know, um, uh, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think money grows on trees. And I know this is a lot of money. Um, but I at least want us to be presented with the best case scenario so we can then make a decision about how we do it. You know, um, what I want to avoid, just to be crystal clear, is my home Bay United getting stuck with a very large fundraising effort every year to maintain the field. We can't do it and we won't do it. We want to run programs for kids and adults. We don't mind contributing a bit. We don't mind making that part of our fundraising drive. But if this is a significant effort in addition to what we're having to do to raise funding, we're not going to be able to take over the maintenance of the field. It's not right, right? It, it, it's not, not right for us to do that. So we're asking the town for support. And so it's very similar to what the pool gets in terms of an operational grant. So that's the scoop. Just a reminder, just a reminder, you've made a priority of attracting young families. This club does that. This facility does that. When you go down there, there's young people on that basketball court and on that field all the time. Even when the signs say, don't be on it. There's kids on that field playing football. Richard will speak to that, right? My son, unfortunately, was one of them. Um, right? The strategic plan explored shared services and partnerships for efficient service delivery while connecting with community passion and interest. I think that's what we're talking about here in this, ma this maintenance partnership together. And then, of course, facilitating the provision of recreational opportunities by supporting and empowering community groups and initiatives. This definitely falls within kind of your assets fact sheet. And I, I, think, it, I think it's fairly safe to say that between our two organizations, we provide the majority of the year-round recreational facilities in my home bay between our two organizations. I'm not saying we do it all, I'm just saying we do a vast amount of it between our two organizations. And that is something that the municipality at the moment isn't having to take responsibility for because volunteer-led community organizations are stepping up to do it. Now, we can also have a great conversation among each other about the pros and cons and rights and wrongs of that. And I would love to have that conversation at some point uh, if you're ever open to it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be brief. And I, I think I, I think I could say I don't want to speak on behalf of Tim, but we're happy to do it. You know, we 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 enjoy. We all we don't like. I'm not part of the board of, of, of Home Day Center because I need something to do. I I really you know did it. Yeah. Well, I first saw I love Lynn Henniger gave me no choice, but, uh, <laughs> but but also you know as I as I you know settled into the role, I, re I I really enjoy it. But we do recognize what Tim Tim concluded with that 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 you know that from time to time we are going to be the support of, of the town to to just you know make this a special place. And I think it will be. I mean. The outside of the building, our building, because of our fundraising and our grant application, it's going to look a whole lot better in six months than it does now. Uh, we're starting in April on the, on the back of the building, and eventually the old school will be entirely repainted. Um, so, you know, we don't have a lot of money to throw into the field. Uh, that's for sure. We are, um, but one thing we didn't talk about that you will see in the draft agreement, Dylan and Tim and I and a few other people from the Mahomes Bay Center board have spent about three or four or five hours over the last month talking about things, talking about this and 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 the, the and you'll see that that agreement. I understand uh, on March 9th. 
Um, we, we talk about booking the field. So Mahone Bay United, I think it's safe to say, will have priority. Other users will want to book it, and there would be a fee, charge, a fee attached to that. We haven't got quite to the point of deciding, A, how much, and B, where does the money go? I personally have proposed that that money go to the maintenance of the field. So therefore, any costs that are put in, I guess, by the town, we, you know, over time, we, we could offset some of those numbers that, that, that Tim just showed. It's just that at this point, we don't know what the demand is going to be. There will be no heavy metal concerts at night. In fact, the, the field closes at dusk, so there'll be no uses at, at, at night. So just if, 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 that, uh, if that reference scared you at all. But, uh, but I'm also here tonight just to, to, to offer our full support for this. I think it's, uh, I think it's a great opportunity to move forward and uh, uh, that, that will become yet another sort of centerpiece of, uh, of this community. Mm. So, okay. yeah. yeah. Thanks, Dave. I think it is worth saying that, isn't it? Like, I love this little soccer club. I can't believe what we've managed to do in the last, you know, in the last five years to go from 16 kids to 225 kids to go from two volunteers to 40 volunteers. I mean, it's and needless to say, you know, like, you know, the demographics of the town, there aren't 225 kids in this town. So they're coming from. We're serving the Mahone Bay area, yeah, so, which, the, which the town does. The yeah, town so, so we're area. bringing people into town. And, you know, if I had a 12 year old, uh, playing soccer from what, what would it be four to five p.m. I'd probably drop them off to school and head down to the pub or down to the grocery store. And so I mean, it, it's uh, it, it's helping with you know the business uh, yeah. as well. So yeah, it's probably most certainly true. Any questions, Council? I just yeah. want to say I think the work you've done is is fabulous. You. And you're to be commended, and and I know you you took the lead in a lot of this, Tim. But you know the the 40 volunteers plus, because I'm sure if you add up every parent who's done something along the way, they don't fit into that that round number of 40. Um, you know that that field has been a long time recreation. No, I've always seen it as that as a life. Long resident and you know have used that state soccer for many years on that field track and field whatever um you know it's good to see the upgrades and that it's it's come alive again hmm. and i i understand where you're coming from is you know i've been a long time tennis club member you know know the the work that goes into you know getting grants and you know it people don't realize all the work that goes on behind the scenes to make things work like they do. So you're to be commended on that. Thank and you. I look forward to further discussions on, on the um, the ongoing. I did note there was quite a lot of support and, and some of the documents that came through for this strategic plan. Um, okay. A lot of um, support from the community about the future of the soccer field. Great. Well, there's been lots of people involved in it. I mean, certainly I've been out there, but there's been multiple people crafting budgets and someone else responsible for the relationship to occur and mm -hmm. someone else talking to contractors and someone else you know so there's been you know lots of people within the little mm -hmm. Mahone Bay United community involved in all different aspects of that and so I think that uh, I think your commendation goes to everyone well and I and, thank you and I and I I really like you said you said about drop you know flying drones and and different the multi-use of, of yeah. the sports field because you know I some, you know, we, we do have issues with the wharf now, people aren't allowed to fish, and that's become a concern in our community, that a space that was always traditionally and historically uh, uh, a place where townspeople could go and go in a line and catch some mackerel is no longer available to them, and that has become an issue. So right. I think going forward, it's good to see the use, the wide public use. Right, and so like Aikido uses the field, Tai Chi uses the field, uh, the rugby club uses the field from Bridgewater. We use the field. Baby Community School uses the field. The run club uses the field. I mean, the, the, the cycling shop uses the field. I mean, there's so many organizations. It's not just MBU who is benefiting from the upgrading of that field. Almost anybody who's involved in any kind of recreation in this community is leveraging that field at some point in the, in the year, um, as well as community groups that are doing things like the community picnic and, and mm -hmm. other community events that they've now got a far better facility to be able to do that on, you know. And then I'm hoping what happens is we have kids playing in the middle and elder members of the community walking around the outside. I, I, I truly hope it becomes an intergenerational 
meeting space, you know, which I think we don't have in our community necessarily, where younger people are meeting older people and parents are getting, I just hope it, I hope it has, the dream would be it becomes a bit of a, a hub for where the community meets and spends time together in all kinds of different pursuits. So, thank you, thank you, David. Yeah, a, Any just, other comments? Yeah, that that we have? A comment and a question for the Home Base Center. I think there was a proposal that was sent to council just before we got onto council around some very big ideas about how recreation can be done better by the town, and and uh, that's what instigated the. If you if you look at the. Um, uh, strategic plan we talked about engaging community groups like a country yeah, yeah. Yeah, terms and, and sort of wondering would you still see may, maybe it's just a reminder that that dream is there would you still see Mahombe Center being interested in partnering with the town because we don't have a recreation department and a recreation arm um, interested in partnering with the town to actually move some of those things forward I in my heart and I've mentioned a few times before, it's interesting we have a cemetery committee, and I'm not picking, picking on your committee. I'm <laughs> <laughs> dying in our cemetery committee. Come on, Easy. Easy. Very <laughs> so we, we, we really want to take care of, of, of the folks who pass away in this community, uh, but we, we need to equally take care of people uh, when they're alive well, and healthy. And so yeah, I, I'm not familiar with the document you were. I think it was before my time yes, too. I am but, it, but it is part of our strategic plan too, to, yeah. which is why we, you know, with, with Mahone, the United said, can we come and use the gym? We have to, we have to do a little inside baseball. We have to be careful of which kids use our gym because we haven't got covers for the heat pumps yet. Yes. So we don't want soccer balls hitting those things. And, and we're, <laughs> Nobody we're, above 12 years old uses the Mahone Bay Center in at the gym at the moment because <laughs> they might damage the heat pumps. Yeah. 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 No, but it, yeah, to answer your question. That's, yes. Okay. That's yeah. 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 Okay. Anything else? When do you need when do you need to know about procurement for something like the automated mower is that something that you can buy off the shelf or is that something yeah the automated easier? mower is it the automated mower um i mean the sooner we get it the more we save uh -huh. bluntly you know what i mean like and uh, so that's that feels like to me in my little brain that feels like a no-brainer purchase the the thing that we need to know quickly um is the the, the supply of seed for example uh -huh. isn't instant you know what I mean? So if we, so we want to be able to move ahead with reseeding this. <laughs> I need to let the boat just nature's reflection landscaping, who we've worked with so far and who the town has recommended to us. And we've done all kinds of explorations with other people and have landed there. Um, uh, they would need to know pretty quickly to be able to secure the seed in time to get it in the ground so we could use it end of April. So just just cutting to the chase, the, yeah. the pretty quickly, uh, a, a good answer. Uh, an answer in July is not going to be no. very helpful. No. So when you need, when we're talking quickly, you're meaning like, and next month. Yeah. If you gave me an answer in July, I don't know what I'd do. We'd be using the top end of the field till next year. Okay. Fair enough. Right. Like the like you know, there's minimum things that need to be done to finish the work, mm -hmm. right? On on that field operationally, you know, and um, and I certainly don't think it makes sense to be paying lots of money for a for manual mowing when you could have an automatic mower in place, you know, but, but um, yeah, yeah. And I think in a, you know, in a town of, like ours where there's lots and lots of people, I think, you know, the, I think, I think access to recreational facilities is becoming increasingly important mm -hmm. for lots and lots of reasons. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you very much. If I can add one little <laughs> item, as this is probably very brief, all the rules, 30 seconds. I just saw something in your previous meetings minutes about a welcome event for newcomers. I think you were specifically speaking about the, the healthcare workers from Africa, mm -hmm. but we're doing one of the welcome dinners yeah. at the center on April 16th for the the Africans, the Ukrainians, the Syrians, everybody who mm -hmm. has who's come in the last three, four years. So, you know, I just wanted to extend an invite to you and also let you know that. You know, as the center, we consider that our, you know, that's part of what we do. It's, so I think it's, another, it's another high neighbor event. Yeah. 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 Paul, Paul's running the show again. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Both. All right. Thanks for having us. Thank you, gentlemen.
Okay, let's go on then to item four, correspondence. We have nothing under action items. We have one note under information items. Mary, uh, I'd move to receive and file uh, item 5.1. Okay, we have a seconder. Councilor now on the motion. All in favor? Thank you. Let's go to staff reports. 6.1 staff report to council. I think CAO is ready to respond to questions that the council may have. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, as usual, this is the larger update of the month in the second meeting. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them. I just had one question, um, Mayor. Um, I noticed deep in the package, which is pretty comprehensive, as you mentioned, um, that the cemetery um, tree removal and limbing program is has just recently started or is about to start. Is um, is Jonathan um, is Jonathan shepherding that in collaboration with the arborists, Dylan? So uh, the company whose proposal was selected have a registered arborist as part of their proposal. Okay. So that person is the first to develop and oversee the plan of work. Um, Jonathan's not on site throughout, so he's administering the contract. He mm -hmm. received the plan of work from the arborist associated with this contractor, um, but he's not on site throughout mm -hmm. the process. So, like they're making sure they're doing everything. At the Does the contractor have access to the Peter Dunker notes that we did from the walk the walkabout? To I, I don't know that the contractor exactly has those notes. I mean, obviously Jonathan has had those notes mm -hmm. um but it wasn't we didn't put out those notes verbatim with the contract okay so yeah I, can I, we can we just make sure that before change the chainsaws stop start that we have uh we're all on the same page on what's happening there um i, I can't say anything that's happened today i think they were just okay. cleaning up the already dead limbs mostly today okay. but uh, Jonathan and I are meeting in the morning, and I already have a note to talk anyway, to Anyway, I know I know you're well aware of the sensitivities yeah. about, you know, less is more as as yes. per cutting, and less is more definitely in, in that in, in that cemetery. So uh, and, fair and no matter what we do, there'll be some deviation, um, but uh, I mean, you know, the intention is certainly for your work to be reflective of those, those discussions. Fair enough. Anyway, you've got the, you yeah. got the message. Thanks, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Councilor Ronald Scroft. Yes, thank you. Um, item 40, um, with the continue with area dialogue with Mr. Sampson, um, we had asked for a site visit, the possibilities, um, and a letter written to or some co contact with Mr. Sampson about um, counselors who wish to go on site. If you did get back to me and let me know he was looking at dates. Okay. But I haven't heard from him since then. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Mayor, I move that we receive the staff report for information. Thank you. We got a lot easy here. <laughs> Do we have a second or on the motion? Deputy Mayor seconds. On the motion. On the question. All in favor. Motion is carried. Let's go to the Remo operating budget, item 6.2. All right. Well, while this is a staff report, I guess uh, the introduction is pretty straightforward. This is to the town from the uh, Remo board who did approve this budget. Uh, the practice is for it to then be circulated to the councils mm -hmm. for our contribution, uh, which is not a substantial change from last year. I don't think there's any. Um, I would have no reservations about recommending this mm. budget, uh, which we usually would we would approve typically on the spot as opposed to referring to budget on account of our our share is you know fairly predictable and not that significant 3700 to 4300 yeah which in is terms just the of cpi i think it's a, would, it's a good deal i would move that we uh, approve the remo operating budget for 2324 thank you do we have a seconder deputy mayor seconds on the motion all in favor motion is carried <clears throat> Let's go to the staff report uh, on the vaccination policy. If you recall, I think it was late 2022, early 2023, which was, was in the policy needs to be reviewed. And that's what staff have done. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, in this case, you know, we, we had a requirement to review the policy. We have reviewed the policy. 
Um, staff had a, a fairly significant amount of discussion amongst employees and at the management level uh, and recommend that the policy stay on file as it, as it currently stands. We're not recommending an update to it, but we're also not recommending its repeal. <clears throat> Mayor, so I, I believe as council deliberated the original vaccination policy, and of course that that deliberation has to be understood in the context of the timing, which was very early in COVID, um, before there was even a roll of, of max vac vaccination, and certainly before we were on to shot number five or six, um, we were, if you recall the timing, we were all reflecting on where the provincial percentages were, and we're talking about just, we could just get to 70%, just get to 75%, then uh, mass vaccination will work. So, you know, our, our municipal government at the time certainly was of the opinion that the vaccination um, policy would help spur on higher percentages of compliance with the, uh, with the Department of Health and their recommendations at the time. Um, as we fast forwarded to almost three years later, now that we're in deep into you know, early 2023, I, I do reflect back on our conversations and some of the chat and some of the debate we had about whether we thought this was a good idea. It did it did pass, and I, I I supported it like many around the table did at the time. But we did insert the sunset clause for a reason, and that reason was because we, as a council, thought that inevitably the time would come when the policy could could be retired and go away. I noticed that Lunenburg rescinded their vaccine vaccination policy last week. And I do wonder with the virtue of the vaccination uh, policies now, which would actually preclude us from hiring someone or in the absence of having the, <laughs> the vaccinations under whatever that definition is, and it continues to evolve as we all have had a shot. I think we've all had shots in the last three months, probably have another shot sometime later on in the summer and then another one in, in next winter. So I don't know what the world will look like two or three years from now, but in my, in my view, the sunset clause was inserted in the policy and the motion to revisit this policy was really being made to end at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I, I'm having a difficult time getting, getting my head around the idea that we would just let it roll into perpetuity. Um, if, if, the opinion of the council um, is that it shouldn't be rescinded today. Well, I guess I could live with it. But the idea that we're just simply going to walk away from it and never rescind it or never revisit it to have this conversation again, um, which is, I think, the staff recommendation, uh, I can't support that. Um, so that's one, one opinion around the table. But I, you know, I, I'd be prepared to rescind the policy if uh, but I'm curious to hear what other people's perspectives are. Now, keep in mind that we're having this discussion not on the question because no motions were made, which we should have done. Mm -hmm. But Councillor Feeney, or I'm sorry, Councillor yeah, Wilson, yeah. you look so much alike. <laughs> <alone. I know. laughs> our, our bla we were blessed. Oh, yeah. um, first of all, I mean, the, the policy as it currently stands, most of the definitions are out of date. So it's defining a fully vaccinated someone with two shots of Pfizer or whatever it is. And I think you need five or six now to be considered up to date. Um, I, I think this thing is, is basically gone old code and should be put to death. Merciful. Okay. Interesting that that most of the uh, the medical, the provincial, certainly the, the federal, you've got one one side of the coin that you no longer have to wear masks. Uh, they're no longer making vaccinations mandatory. You don't have to provide proof of COVID vaccination when you enter the country or when you leave the country or when you get to a country in Europe. But then you've got people like Dr. Tam at the federal level who are encouraging people to continue to keep a mask handy just in case. But for the most part, it appears that the official word is that the masks and the vaccinations have gone by the by. And there's more focus on that natural immunity that most people can build up to. Yeah, I agree that uh, I think it's 
potent of its usefulness. Uh, I know speaking as a member of the fire department, you know, we're still having to ask for that when we get a member. And I don't know if that's being done as much as it should be, but uh, I know it would certainly make it easier on that. And I think it would make it easier just to hire and staff within the town general as any position. So I think it's a little bit of Okay. CAO? I was just going to comment on that last point because I think the report does cover that from staff's perspective, we don't feel that we've passed up any hiring opportunities on this basis. Like we don't feel it's in any way affected our ability to recruit. Uh, there's been no pushback from any of the more than 40% of our staff who've turned over since COVID. Um, everybody's been quite willing. And in fact, many new staff have expressed their appreciation for the policy. So just want to maybe refute the notion that it affects staff uh, recruitment. It, it may, in terms of fire department members, I, I, that would be your area to comment on. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So I think if if we can remember, I was I was opposed to the policy in the first place because from my perspective, it, it had no basis in evidence that this was the way to go. And and I think we agreed that we'll revisit it now. But from my perspective, I knew this time would come where the evidence will have shown that that, that is not the approach you should choose if you're, if you're, if you're trying to get people to choose health behaviors that are good for them. Managing things is not the way you get them to that place in, in many ways. I, I think we should probably ask ourselves, so why, why don't we have a vaccination policy around measles, for example, uh, shingles, flu, well, the flu shot people are supposed to get every year. Why don't we have a policy around that? We've chosen one particular, yes, it was new, it was a, it was a new, uh, a new virus that we didn't know much about and we did what we had to do to survive that period. But at least now we have that three three years rear view, I guess, uh, look that you can take a look at sort of say, well, this policy does not necessarily get us to be any better or any healthier. In fact, for me, what it does, it just discriminates. So if somebody who's chosen not to, not, not to use a vaccine, you're basically telling them they're not part of this society. We don't want them to be part of the society. That's being intolerant to a certain extent. So I, I would say that it's about time that we, we got to that. It doesn't serve us in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? Can I make a motion? Your name again is Oh Wilson. <laughs> yes, please go ahead. I'm, I'm sure the clerk has it on record. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to move that. Uh, Council will address staff to rescind the uh, COVID-19 vaccination policy as it currently stands. Okay, seconded by Councilor Feeney. I got that right. Good ah, you heard the motion. Just a quick clarification. I don't think you would put the direct staff part in the motion, right? It's just council. Just a moment. Because yeah. so, yeah. it's you actually. Somebody has to hit that delete button. Well, yes, yeah. We'll remove it from the motion. <laughs> So the motion is to delete the, yeah. the policy. And this includes all our facilities, town will... Yeah. And okay. yes. On the question, all in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Okay. And we'll all be sick tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go with 6.4. The infamous noise bylaw. <laughs> yes, CAO? Will, I'm sure this will be a really short conversation. So uh, <laughs> we had been asked in two different meetings in two different ways to look at noise bylaws having to do with issues that have come up in town and uh, examples in other communities. And, and uh, Maureen, I guess this is a, a, a parting gift for Maureen. She's got a ton of work looking into this. And it certainly hasn't given us a, a silver bullet, which, which we did not expect it to. Um, but, you know, the conclusions are laid out there. I'm not going to restate them. Uh, what, where we essentially ended up was with a recommendation that uh, it's been quite explicitly by email. It was the question was asked, does this recommendation solve issues of noise that we're that we've been experiencing in the community? Uh, no, it, it doesn't do that. Um, but what it does is it, it is one area where we can look ahead to possible conflicts that arise between different uses of property that result in noise bylaw complaints um, or, or suggestions that there should be a noise bylaw for which to lodge complaints. 
Um, and so, you know, a proactive solution to that would be to ensure that the plan the home process does really consider uh, mixed use conflicts that arise uh, from land use guidelines. That's the recommendation. Obviously, uh, happy to take questions, uh, discussion on the subject. Um, <clears throat> Mayor, I thought the, thought the, uh, the report was really well packaged mm -hmm. and comprehensive. Thank you again, Maureen, for that. Um, you know, I think you read my mind, Dylan, on the phrase. I mean, there's really no easy silver bullet that resolves the problem. I know that the origins for these requests kind of came out of two themes, one being speeding cars up and down Main Street and up and down Pleasant Street. Um, the second one really being about, um, you know, uh, residential and commercial businesses that are living side by side and the commercial business being open deep into the night. And we've had um, delegations from the community at large trying to, and, and so we were searching for searching for a solution and, and maybe the noise bylaw won't, won't accomplish that. But I do think that we should remember we may, we may have to take other actions um, to resolve that type, those types of issues as they come up again next summer. Um, we've seen the, the uh, various opinions on the virtues of the traffic calming. Um, well, while good intentions, maybe not everyone agrees uh, with their effectiveness. Um, so we'll, we'll 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 learn and kind of make changes if changes are required. But I think it seems like Main Street is calmer. It, oh, Suzanne would be able to speak to this well, but um, maybe not to everyone's satisfaction. But I think uh, I think uh, the the package is pretty self-explanatory. On the other item around um, uh, the other item about um, commercial and residential properties living coexisting side by side. Mm -hmm. I do I do think we may have to talk about hours of operation as the silver bullet. Um, and uh, that might have to be done through another motion down the road, but that strikes me that uh, of the next step to resolve that other particular issue. Okay. CAL? Oh, I think the deputy mayor is I just in terms of the hours of opportunity, I just want to make it clear hours of operation through the land use bylaw would not apply retroactively to existing businesses. Mm -hmm. So so in that, in that sense, hours of operation, you're talking more of a conventional noise bylaw, quiet hours concept. Mm -hmm. So I just, just want to make sure there's no confusion mm -hmm. about, because we did have previously a discussion, like, could we use the land use bylaw to regulate existing conflicts but no, because they exist now, which means that they will not be required to in come, come up, yeah, come up to yeah. date with some of the changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, deputy mayor. Yeah, so well, so um, um, I think this is a good direction to head into. My my worry is around timelines. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, I, I don't know what the timeline is for that plan my home engagement process. I, I had hoped and assumed that we'd have gone out by now and. By the spring, we'll be doing. Uh, there'll be lots of community engagement, and so this, what this tells me is that we will have the same complaints come to town council, spring, summer, and we'll we'll not have done anything. And I think, at least for one particular scenario, we know we need to do something. Mm -hmm. And so, me, I was sort of wondering whether this is something that can be can sort of can have a two two part solution whereby. Maybe the larger elements of a larger bylaw, noise bylaw, can be taken on through the plan Mahombe process. But we, the planners, can give us a solution for this particular scenario that we faced last year. And I think we had conversations, and to a certain extent, those folks are expecting us to come back with something concrete sometime soon. Uh, so I guess two things. The, the first part was just on timeline for plan Mahombe. So there'll be an update on your. Um, March 9th agenda, okay. but we are anticipating the public engagement phase to basically run from April through June. So that still is the expectation. Mm -hmm. And there'll be a, you know, here's what the consultants are planning in terms of communications and sessions and different issues to tease out. And mostly those issues have been referred by motion council. So, you know, you guys know what they're gonna be, but um, this would be another one that they would they would have time just just now because they're they're developing materials for this to add this to the to the list of things. As far as the second point about could we ask them for a solution, I guess I'm, I guess I'm a little concerned about the notion that 
because once again, the planners can't like any any change that is approached from a land use planning perspective won't won't affect the issue that has been discussed previously. Uh -huh. So that's where like really the planners are not they they can advise and will advise, and that's what this motion is about in in the future how you can avoid this type of a conflict. But the one that exists now that you're referring to. Is, is you know is, is, it's essentially grandfathered in. I know Heather says we're not supposed to use that word, but it's, uh -huh. you know that is already an existing conflict, and all of the uses were permitted. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, the planners are not the right people, I guess is my point to, to turn to in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't deny that that there is an expectation of some kind of follow on to that and saying, well, now we're looking at future situations like this, and we'll learn from your experience. Probably doesn't go a long way to the people involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that might be the best we can do in the short term, but to look, you know, because then you'd have good old fashioned moral suasion. You know, we have, I think, I think the uh, uh, Maureen's report really talks about um, that quiet time in Lunenburg, which is now the conventional norm in the community. Like, you know, the town mm -hmm. is quiet at nine o'clock. That's, you know, in that community, that's the social norm. I mean, we, we may not, it is definitely the most affordable form of yeah, law enforcement. That, well, that, that's just it. And over time, the, the social norm becomes accepted practice because it's in their best interest to do that. I don't know if that can happen here, but I mean, you have to start somewhere. So you, you know, you see, you start by making those subtle changes. If, if the if the changes that we're we're looking for cannot be achieved through the public engagement process. Of Plan Mahon Bay, I think that's what I heard you just say. Why even mention that as a an alternative at this point? Because if I, as a citizen, I would expect when the Plan Mahon Bay comes out, the noise issue is going to be dealt with because that they're going to make changes that won't allow the noise to be made. But that's not the case because we can't do it in retrospect. So the, the why even is that is that instead of being reactive to situations that have come into existence in the past, we will take a proactive approach going forward. It doesn't. It's not intended to preclude how we deal with the existing issue. Okay. But if we don't learn from it, there will definitely be another similar issue in the future. So so, 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 so it's so a two prong thing, and this yeah, this okay. recommendation only deals with the second. Yeah. And the reasons why we didn't provide a recommendation that conclusively deals with the first are outlined in the report. It's yeah. it's not that there aren't approaches that are that are, you know Maureen investigated. It's just that you know at, at the very least a, a significant budgetary component may need to be discussed if if we're if we're really talking about a, a noise enforcement mechanism. Mm -hmm. But convention is uh, you know mm -hmm. you don't have to have a noise enforcement mechanism. Just be aware that. Putting out there that we are doing so, Cost and then not scoring. doing so. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Councillor Wilson, and then Deputy Mayor. I pass. Okay, Deputy Mayor. So, uh, I I somehow disagree with that cost uh, piece. If we do, if we do take this, so I agree. We need to take this through the plan Mahomi process. That will deal with the proactiveness of making sure that our plans and the MPS talk about. Uh, how we deal with noise going forward. The, 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 when I think about our concern, concerns right now around noise, there will be very, very few spots that need enforcement. We've not had complaints about noise all over town. It's been particular spots. And what we need to do is make sure that what, if it, we're engaging either RCMP or the bio, bio enforcement person, that they're available at those spots in particular times that we know that noise occurs and we can clamp down on that. So for that cost piece, I'm not very sure that I agree that it will be a costly thing for the town. It's just that it will be slightly, well, it will cost us slightly more, but not exorbitantly, exorbitantly more. So I would propose that we actually pursue a noise bylaw, put it in place and figure out how much it will cost us for particular spots, not the entire town. Wait, so can I just ask, would you put in the bylaw that it only applied to particular spots? So, so you, you're a sub, the assumption that that report is based on is that all of a sudden now, we'll be having complaints 
from all over town around noise. Is that the, that's the, well, we need that's, to have the capacity the to respond to complaints if we've opened up the invitation for people to lodge complaints. True, mm-hmm. but but so, so think about think about this. We have fifty kilometers per hour driving laws all over the province. We don't have police sitting in all those spots or in all the school areas to actually monitor that. What that what what it does it just prevents people from assuming that they can drive to through those spots at a very high speed. So it creates that idea in people's minds that this is what's acceptable in a particular community. But that doesn't mean that we have to in, invest in having RCMP in all the spots where the speed limit is much lower than 100, right? So I I don't buy fully into the idea that we will have to significantly, we will have to up our budget on, 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 on violent enforcement, but not as significantly as we think we have. Well, I guess, you know, I think staff's job is to provide you with these estimates. Council obviously can and, and you know, shouldn't shy away from optimism. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, that's a great <laughs> attitude. Yeah. Uh, you know, when it comes down to it, the way you just described the law working is actually the way that all laws work. Yeah. And policing services are still incredibly costly. Mm-hmm. So just, yeah, yeah. But we don't have those numbers. So, so for instance, they like could be they, more costly. I don't disagree exactly. with that. But they are still very costly. The, ch- the challenge is now is we don't have a counter punch to the prevailing theme that hey, there's no there's no noise bylaw. I can do whatever I want, and you can't do a thing about it because there's no bylaw, and I'll just continue on my merry way, and. I think what we need to do is we need to at least in some structured, responsible way, communicate through whatever language we can use, which is bylaws, that no, um, you know, we may be unsuccessful in the implementation of the, uh, in the enforcement of the bylaw, you know, not 100 percent of the time. But over time, you'll get the pe- you'll get the message that this uh, this behavior is not really conducive with. Um, our commu- with the community as a, as a whole, and mm-hmm. this isn't what people want. And so, and we can have the, and we can let the debate happen in the public square. Right now, it's been one way, one way to, uh, it's just been one sided because the, the folks really haven't had anybody in their corner. Councilor, yeah, I, I, I hadn't really thought this too clearly, but I agree with that. I think that. First of all, you can have a bylaw that is a universal umbrella, and that doesn't require you, as the deputy director said, to have a bylaw officer on every corner with a with a, a decibel meter waiting mm-hmm. for somebody to mm-hmm. burst a balloon or something. <laughs> but it does create an environment which which helps to create the notion of a social norm. Because when people say, I can do whatever I like, I say, well, actually, no, you can't. And eventually, over time, you get to the place you want to be at or close to it. So I, I, I think there's a way to craft a bylaw that could be effective in that regard. And I think we should pursue that. Deputy Mayor and then CAO. Yeah, and, and probably the last piece I would say is that, oh, Probably what, what needs to be done is an example set as to how we can respond to a bio infraction mm-hmm. that actually sets the tone going forward. We, right now, we, we don't even do that. So it's assumed that we, we don't have the teeth to actually do something about it. I don't think that's the case. Right? Very strange point. I guess, <laughs> is it okay for me to connect? Yeah. I would say exactly the opposite is yeah. true. You guys are actually proposing a situation where we would actively not have the ability to enforce what we said we were going to do. Right now, we do enforce our bylaws. We're not enforcing bylaws that don't exist. You know, what we're talking about here is, is something we haven't given ourselves the authority to enforce. So bylaw enforcement's not there because there's no bylaw that, that is needs to be enforced in this case. And I think that's been clarified in previous reports about the particular scenario that you're talking about. But I just wanted to, just this one final comment in terms of the idea of Convention, because I don't, I'm a big believer in convention. It mm-hmm. works a lot of the time, but I'm just going to out myself about an example where it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. I've had to go to Lunenburg a few times over the past number of months. Lunenburg has a lot of parking meters. Generally, go to Lunenburg. I'm going to 
pay those meters because the convention is you're supposed to pay the meters. In the winter, they're not doing meter enforcement as regularly. In the winter, I know that the enforcement isn't there. Do I always pay the meter? No, because I know the enforcement isn't there. Mm -hmm. So the convention only works up to the point where enforcement does actually occur. And it won't take long for people to start saying, well, I can just get away with it anyway, because sure, they have a bylaw, but they don't enforce <laughs> it. So I think there's some risk to convention with no teeth. And I think you just acknowledge that, Deputy Mayor. But I do believe that that's the direction Council's conversation is going. So, so fair enough. I mean, agree completely. And and I think what we I, I think what we know to be true is that you enforcement has a cost. And so I think there'd be a recognition that uh, on, in a targeted manner, there would be there would have to be council support for for an appropriate budget to to ensure enforcement. Um, Tactically, as we know, the RCMP has um, targeted programs throughout the province and sometimes Lunenburg County is the targeted area and there's a lot of police cars here and then other years, not so much. I mean, in, in, we would see, we would, we, but at least we'd be able to understand, um, we'd be able to understand what the cost is to put a program in place for enforcement and then and with an appropriate budget. Counts for now. Yeah, I agree that, uh, you know, we should have something in place. Uh, enforcement is a big issue, but I think if you can increase the enforcement a bit for the first while, after a while, it will become the norm and people won't be as concerned about it. So you will say, OK, we have our bylaw officer in town on Friday or Saturday night from 10 to midnight or whatever for a while. And the once he starts enforcing some of it for a short period of time, then people are going to say, oh, they are enforcing it. So you could sort of lax off on a little bit and let convention take over. And I mean, you all know that that's what we do now because our, our bylaw enforcement is only available for limited hours out of each week. And we do parking enforcement when the bylaw enforcement person yeah. is here, unless we receive a complaint, in which case we'll deal with it. Okay. We'll just keep writing tickets. Over and over and over again. I would never have known that there was no um, bylaw for, for noise because the RCMP have always responded uh, when somebody has had a noise complaint. Um, I know that from experience. So uh, you're <laughs> wow. the <laughs> no, but it, I mean, I, I had no idea until I read these notes that, that it was being done. So um, I would, you know, I think. Um, I really like that quiet hour, you know, I thought that's something, you know, we, I think that's something we could look into as well, but um, I think we do need to have something there that we can, and, and the key point is, you know, you can do all the bylaws, but unless you have enforcement and the enforcement has to be the component. And just since people are watching us on TV, we should acknowledge the RCMP are still doing that. We're yes. not doing it just otherwise. Yes. They have the authority to do that regardless of our bylaws. Yeah. Yeah. Deputy Mayor. So I'd like to move that council refer the issue of noise in mixed use neighborhoods to the Plan Mahombe public engagement process and at the same time uh, embark on a process to bring up noise by law to council. Uh, do you want to wait for the second? Councillor Wilson? I just second. Seconded, okay. I was going to ask if is there any way we can make them two separate motions just for the sake of having two totally different timelines to deliver on these motions? No, no, I want to make them the same. Okay, all right. That's right. right. That's right. I, I did that deliberately yeah. because I, I think we need to have a bylaw in place soon before the summer. Yeah, before the summer. Okay. That's why I feel like yeah. that one should get the priority. But uh, Okay, so yeah. if you, uh, uh, I can. I can make them too. Yeah, do whatever you want. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so, sure. So I'd like to move that uh, staff embark on uh, crafting a noise bylaw for the town as soon as possible. I will put a timeline to that okay. to be to be in place before this before summer. All right. Second. Okay. Move and seconded that uh, staff develop a noise bylaw to be in place. By um, Victoria Day weekend, sure. that's the twenty-something of May. Just going to make sure the caveat is there. We can only get it to you 
Yeah. To be in place yeah. is actually yeah. up to you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right. Think, uh, pardon me. I just suggest that we add, you know, add um, that element. That it needs to be funded so that whatever the staff's recommendation, but funding should be also should referred be to the, should like, be should be, we, we, But do that as a separate motion anyway. Just, yeah, just say as a motion referred to budget enforcement costs to noise file. Okay, so the first motion is Deputy Mayor and your Executive Dean Councilor Wilson for the creation of the noise bylaw, right? On that motion, all in favor? Okay. And we have a second motion that the cost of the bylaw be referred to the budget process. Yes. Okay. Councilor Feeney seconds that one. All in favor? Motion's carried. That council referred the issue of noise in the mixed use neighborhoods, which is the, the one that we were providing. Yeah. Okay, do we have a seconder for that motion? Councillor, now, Kangadi Wilson. <laughs> okay, you've heard the motion. All in favor, the motion is carried. Thank you. So that's we're gonna frame that. <laughs> Once this turned into a real bylaw, we'll turn you the goal. Under yeah, I'm sure Mo will be hanging on. Put it on a frame. <laughs> Council <laughs> items, we've got three. 7.1, the anti-racism racism task force request for support. That anti-racism task force, the, the there was a contract and a firm had been contracted to develop the um, anti-racism task force concept. And at the last mayor's deputy CAOs, it was confirmed that the town of Lunenburg who had the contract with the firm had in fact canceled uh, the contract. They told the company that they were going to take a different route uh, because the company did not seem to be responding to what Chester, Lunenburg, Town of Mahone Bay, Town of Bridgewater, and MODL were asking for. So that, that issue, that item, that support is no longer there from that group. However, if you recall the meeting we had at, uh, up at the Chester landfill site about a year and a half ago, the towns committed at that time, and then it was agreed around this table, that when it became appropriate, funding would be provided to support uh, the anti-racism task force in the county. So it's Lunenburg is back to the drawing board and at the next mayor's deputy CAOs, which we were gonna host it here, but ours has moved to June, I think. Can the park did it not? May. To May. And who's got the next one? Model. March 15th. So, okay, so on March 15th, we'll hear the next round of outputs um, from the contracts. Who's that? Was that me? Yeah, it was your uh, phone. Just, okay. I don't know why. She's in the <laughs> Okay. Um, so that's all there was to that one. And 7.2, appointment to the Heritage Advisory Committee. Clerk, can you assist? Uh, no, I understood there was a was, motion. This is yours, is Sorry, it? Mayor, this was just the official transfer of uh, responsibility from the Deputy Mayor to Councillor Carver um, based on um, the timing of the meetings. So I think, so this, I guess this is just ratifying that decision between for us to- So Councilor Carver is taking over- Yes. On yeah. the Heritage Advisory yeah. Committee. And so yeah. if we need a motion to that effect, yeah. um, we, happy to make that. Thank that you. That Councilor Carver assume Councilor, uh, uh, the Deputy Mayor's um, previous position on the HAC. That was, the, you were the Vice Chair? Yes. 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 She can even be chair if she out of that on the cemetery committee. Come on. By note. Do we have a seconder? Councillor now. All in favor? Motion is carried. 
Yeah, there's uh, another item 7.3. Yeah. It came up um, last evening at the Municipal Joint Services Board regarding procurement of a uh, expensive piece of machinery. Mm. Um, the Coles notes, and you'll see in the deck uh, in the information that's provided, is that they needed to make a timely decision. And the budget, uh, the Joint Services budget is not going to go to the Joint Services Board for another week. And then we'll have to come back to the town council. But the decision on this piece of equipment and this procurement needs to happen immediately. Um, so what uh, what Leslie uh, and the Joint Services Board is requesting is that at this council table, we concur with that recommendation to proceed. The short uh, strokes is the equipment has about 500 hours on it, and it's about $130,000 cheaper than a brand new, a brand new um, loader. Um, the other issue is that if you order a brand new loader, it won't arrive for 18 months versus this one can be here in a week. Um, so um, sometimes it's better to be... Organizations are interested right. in buying this machine. So, um, pardon me, there is a recommendation. Um, let me find it here. One moment. <laughs> many open tabs. Mm. Just one second. And the motion is to um, for council to approve the uh, Joint Services Board procurement of the uh, heavy machinery up to an amount of three hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and uh, pass that information back to uh, the Joint Services Board. Okay, and I, I would be fair to say that the Joint Services Board uh, financial situation is in a reasonably yeah. good shape to accommodate this. Yes, yeah, so this is fully budgeted item at the Joint Services at, within mm -hmm. the Joint Services Board. Um, you'll hear more about that budget, but we they ran about another uh, two hundred eighty seven thousand dollars surplus, um, and. Uh, We've got a new uh, COO, a new IT director, and things are going quite well, but you'll get a full report on the, the organization and its uh, financial position through next month. I think. And the finance manager is not particularly no. long in the two either. So no, it's they got a good team yeah. going. I think things have been strong. So I think this equipment, I think the equipment's a little bit under 200, a little under $300,000, but I think the motion is uh, not to exceed $300,000. Yes. Yeah. Seconder? So, okay. You, On the question? On the question uh, so uh, it makes sense, but I think we will need to, and I'm assuming the clerk will do it, is, is we'll need to update our data packet so that people have a sense of what this is because it's sort of data packet. Yeah. yeah. When it goes yeah, out, when it goes the out. minutes yeah. of the meeting go on. Yeah. 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 Because uh, the memo just showed up this afternoon. Yes, yeah. I think my understanding would be uh, that. The deputy mayor is saying to add this to the meeting package. It's yeah. like the online yeah. because yeah. it was added since the package it was just okay. received today. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got a motion on the table. All in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. So that brings us down to committee reports. The Climate and Environment Committee. That's Councillor um, That's me. Carver, isn't it? That's me and Councillor Carver. Yeah. And unfortunately, I missed the last meeting, so I can't really comment. Okay. Was there anything in the in the minutes of the meeting that anyone have any concerns about? Uh, what about the police advisory board meeting from February the second? No. Okay. Ludenberg County Senior Safety Program. That's me. That's me. Mm -hmm. But I think these were these are minutes from um, back when yeah. Yeah. Penny was in January. Yes. Penny was still there. Yes. Councillor Carver was still there. Yes. yes, but I have attended two meetings, so okay. Well, if someone has a pressing question that keeps them awake tonight, all night, can you drop a line from there? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Motion to receive and file. Seconded by Councillor Feeney. 
Moved by Councillor Now. All in favor? Motion's carried. That concludes our agenda. Let's ask the folks that are joining us on YouTube if they have any questions. We do have one question. The question, um, why was the query contained in Mr. Kruger's correspondence not addressed? Mr. Kruger, when he sent that notice in, asked that it be included. I spoke with him and I asked him if he still wanted to have it put in the agenda and he did, but he's satisfied with the responses that he was providing. So the item was added for information purposes only, because I believe he had addressed it to me and to council. Okay. And that's the only question we have online. All right. So you still well, have your own question? Well, I might ask a question. What's happening about the electricity rates? <laughs> A good question. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll leave that to the CAO. We've had a series of hearings at the Utility and Review Board, and he can best describe what the next steps will be in that process. It's like, probably not what you really meant by your question was to say what's happening in terms of the process, but just to answer that part, um, obviously now we're in the follow on to the hearing. There were a number of undertakings issued by the board that staff are responding to and our consultants responding to. And uh, then the board will issue a decision, uh, presumably in the next number of weeks. So that decision is likely to be effective on issue, and uh, and we'll be waiting to find out what their decision is. But I doubt that's really your question. I just wanted you to know what the process from here will be. It's in progress, but when can we expect an answer? So uh, it's, well, the board can't be bound by you know our, our timeline. We we would like a decision as soon as possible because the town was originally requesting rates effective January one, um, but ultimately the board will take as long as they need to take uh, the 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 questions and answers back and forth part will be finished by next week, and then it's just a question of when the board reaches their decision. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. Um, March 9th, seven o'clock. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. We, yeah. Okay. Uh, no other no one else? Okay. Oh, pardon me. I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, it says, can you uh, to follow up to the question about Mr. Kruger's correspondence? Can you please answer the question for us watching? Oh, the crew, uh, let, just let me find the crew statement, if you would. Um, The alternatives that were were considered have been outlined on a number of occasions in a number of documents. And it suggested that the citizens group has formed and provided alternatives and uh, Mr. Kruger both thinks it behooves council to openly discuss them and they have been discussed openly and the, the different options that were possibilities were, were all assessed, not by council, by engineers and or the professionals who do that kind of work. And the town land adjacent to the existing substation, if you're talking about the land that runs from the substation west, up through that, that ravine piece, it doesn't lend itself to the position of solar panels, number one. It doesn't have the appropriate angles to the sun 
and that land has already been expropriated by Nova Scotia Power as part of their power line. If you're talking about the piece of land that's west of the soccer field, which is largely a treed lot, uh, it was deemed inappropriate to remove all of those trees to create an empty piece of land which already existed for the town, owned by the town, around the sewage treatment plant. CAO? Uh, yeah, I think it would be best to probably refer to, as you said, previous responses that have been published on this subject. I was just looking back to try to get the date because I'm from my head, I can't recall, but there was a piece of correspondence last fall from uh, Peter Redden, um, which, which quite significantly detailed alternate sites, sites. And to which we responded with rationale around which sites, each site, why they were considered, what some of the pros and cons were. So um, that is what I would recommend that this anyone interested in viewing uh, would check out. It was last fall. I was just trying to find the actual date of it, and I have not succeeded in finding that as yet. Um, it's on the Solar Garden page. On our website. Um, yeah, on the website. Oh, the, the response it's on the website on the Solar Garden page? On the Solar Garden Project page. And that was a letter from Mr. Reddy. Uh, the, certainly the response well, to Mr. Reddy was yes. explained all of those. Okay. Yeah, I don't remember if his letter was included or not. So that's Mo, if the people go on the website and they click the banner link for the solar page, is that what you mean? That's right. Mm. And um, yes, there's a, let me just see if I can share. I have a windows open. So as, as Mo is looking for that, my, my understanding of why we, we all received in politics is that this question has been answered. Not yes. Even, not even just that one time. Before that, there were, mm -hmm. I think, two iterations yeah. of the same question being asked, and it was documented and answered. And that's yes. why we, from my perspective, we received a file. This document. Uh, although his correspondence team seemed to suggest that alternatives had been identified and were not addressed, which is not the case, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I believe it's sharing now. It's the um, transmission corridor choice. Yeah, I couldn't tell if it was any of these ones. So. Yes. Oh, yes. Open response. Oh, there we go. So yeah. just the title. I wouldn't. Have, I wouldn't have known that was the one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was the title we were given. So find the, find <laughs> I need to change the title on that if that helps. Find the banner link on the town's website and then choose transmission corridor choice. And that's how you'll find the details. Yeah. So from the homepage of the town website, there's a, a special button. Go to that button. Scroll down past the moving images. here. So the January 27th staff report also talks about um, the location of the distribution line. That was the decision about that. So mm -hmm. that's why those ones are there. Thank you. Oh. So it's all there. <coughs> Anything else? <laughs> no further questions, Your Worship. Okay. Well, I, that, uh, that will end our session. But before we go, I would be remiss if I did not mention and thank our, our clerk deputy CAO, Maureen Hughes, who's been uh, with the town for quite a few years and has done invaluable service in support of council and council members, as well as in her relationship with the other staff that are uh, in the town. So Maureen, I personally thank you. And I think on behalf of council as well, thank you for all the great work. Thank you. It will definitely be a
a, a, a huge hole and very, <laughs> very large boots to fill. Thank yes, you. But we hope that you have a, a whatever you're going to. Okay. Two hours. Yeah. Two hours. Uh, Tuesday is my last. Tuesday. Yes. And then you're off to, to the province. Correct. Yes. Good. So I can still find you on YouTube. I'm going to watch the noise file. I'll echo you in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you want to look at the Thank you very much. And thank you to uh, the people at home who joined us uh, on YouTube and the people that joined us here in council chambers. And um, we are going to go into a closed session now under the MGA 222G. So the council can discuss legal advice, which is eligible under solicitor client privilege uh, to be done in camera. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. It takes me back to my old days. I, I was on the, the board of Governor of St. Mary's for eight years. And I was on the Senate for 12. Yeah. And I'm not there anymore. Thank you very much. Is to get his name and phone number? Just in case. Have a good night. Good night. Good luck. Yes, let's um, take five sorry, minutes. Sorry, I have a, a motion, but I don't have a seconder. Thank you. Yes, 